So I, I think this fits in really well because there's uh, a lot of people who are talking about different tools and different ways to go about uh, reproducible analyses and reproducible research sort of uh, in my in my mind has two sort of concepts we have reproducible analysis can we reproduce what we uh, the number part of it and then can we also reproduce the experiment or simulation that we that we used um, so I'm going to specifically talk about reproducible analyses but uh, in, in an ideal world we would be able to sort of have a whole bag of tools that we can use and then everybody programs in different ways, everybody has their own pipelines, we should be able to pull from that bag of tools uh, to come up with our own pipeline that's very reproducible and this would be one of those tools in that, in that bag. Um, okay, it doesn't go forward. So I'm just going to talk a little bit about reproducible research in general and, and one of the, some of the motivations behind why we, we really do need to improve the way many of us do science. Um, and then I'll talk about the software uh, that I've created to do that. A couple of examples, some different analyses that we can do with this software, some of the different capabilities, uh, and then some of the future uh, improvements and future directions because there really is a lot of work that still needs to be done. Like any software project, once you start there, uh, I mean just the the world opens right up and there's all kinds of different things. So let's talk a little bit why scientific studies are difficult to reproduce. Um, so there is an experimental bias, there's a publication bias, there are certain areas of research that we really focus on, uh, they're, they're sort of hot areas, and we end up spending a lot more time in those areas. There's also the concept of, of uh, p-values and um, the fact that we only publish significant results, so there, there's going to be a number of different biases in, in, that, in that sense. Um, I'm not here to specifically talk about the statistical aspects of reproducibility, but there are a whole number of uh, problems that, need to be, that we need to be aware of, we need to keep in mind uh, when, when going about our daily scientific routines. Um, the actual selection of statistical tests, um, originally I was a biologist, and then I sort of transferred over to the bioinformatics world. And you can see when you're embedded in the biology world that statistics are, are almost something you have to do. It's uh, you get done with all of your, uh, all of your experiments and you're, okay, now I gotta do my statistics. And it's really not something that's well thought out. Often people just throw a test on top of something and it's really, it's kind of too bad and we should, we should be very carefully selecting which statistical tests we're doing. There should be bi a biological reason and a mathematical reason. Um, there's a number of issues with multiple testing that exist out there that are, are well known. And then some people will just, oh, well, that statistical test didn't work, so I'm going to try a different one and we'll see what kind of result we get. Uh, and these types of things are uh, what contribute to the lack of reproducibility. Uh, also, there's a lack of easy to use tools. If I'm a biologist, I spend 90% of my time in the lab. I need an easy to use tool. and. Uh, Things like the IPython notebook are great. They're absolutely wonderful in terms of a, an invention. We can do a lot with them, but to teach someone how to use that in a short period of time, if all they need to do is spend maybe 5% of their time doing statistics, it becomes a little bit cumbersome. So uh, the, there does need to be tools that are a little bit easier to use for these kinds of, for people who are less involved in the programming, yet still want to do it a little bit. So another, um, Another reason to do this, uh, there, there have been a couple of sort of meta-studies that, that show that things really aren't that reproducible. There was the big bear health, healthcare study that um, they, they did 67 attempts at trying to reproduce uh, some findings that were reported in, in higher journals. Uh, and you can see the results here, less than a quarter were viewed as being replicated and two-thirds had major inconsistencies. So. It's very difficult to reproduce based on, well, there's a lot of variables in the lab uh, and there might be uh, a lot of variables that we can't control for in the lab, but in terms of a reproducible analysis, there's really no excuse for being able to not reproduce the same, not being able to get the same numbers if we start with the same input data. <clears throat> Here's a, a great presentation by a guy from Duke University, Jim Berger, who uh, talks about many of the statistical issues and some of the things that we can do. Um, and here's a, another publication that talks about this same problem. I'll just refer you to that. 
Uh, so I, I kind of like to dis distill the idea of reproducible uh, research into three components. Uh, the, the components of data sharing, uh, well, uh, to me, I, I believe that there are three components that are necessary to, to make something reproducible. Uh, and fortunately, in computer science, we use, uh, we naturally use some of these. Uh, so with data sharing, the, we have to start with the data. We need an audit trail, which is um, often we use Git or Mercurial or something that's hosted online using the, uh, many of those. Um, and then finally, we have documentation. So you need to be able to read the methods in the paper. You need to be able to read the supplemental materials. So these, these three concepts, these three core concepts of data sharing, audit trail, and documentation um, have sort of an analogous, uh, uh, ha have an aspect in terms of both the lab and in terms of data analyses. I'm not going to go, I don't necessarily need to talk about the details of all that, but it just shows that there are some key concepts that we can go along with. So many of you may already be familiar with this paper. Another reason why we want to do things in a reproducible way, in, in a very transparent way, is that um, some people might have been, th these guys were working sort of in chemotherapies. They were using some, some machine learning type approaches to try to determine which chemotherapy is going to work the best. Um, and they, they had come up with some very promising information. They published it in a few journals. They got some clinical trials rolling. Uh, and then some folks at MD, uh, sorry, was it MD Anderson? Uh, I believe it was MD Anderson. MD Anderson. Yeah, they, they, were, they were looking at it and they decided, they actually found out that many of the, re, the reported findings were false. Um, this, this paper was retracted. Uh, this individual is no longer, uh, the, the lead author is no longer in science. So we have, uh, in addition to just doing poor work, we also have uh, more serious repercussions uh, from doing things that are not reproducible. Yeah. <laughs> Even more serious. So uh, it's, it's extremely important. And transparency, even if we're doing something wrong, if you're being transparent about it, we can use the community to sort of help us along. Um, if we choose the wrong statistical test or there's, some, there's a mistake in our data somewhere, the community can help us with that if we're transparent and we provide our data and we provide our code. Um, so this is just a little bit more. Um, I mentioned before the over-reliance on p-values, the issues that are associated with multiple testing. Uh, why do we want to do this? In the end, we want to promote good practices. That's, that's one of the big things. And for me, a big goal w would be something like, uh, at the end of papers now, we have the author contribution sections. A few years ago, it was a big issue of gift authors and different things. Uh, maybe someday we could see at the end of papers uh, a reproducible research section where you go through and you say, this is where I deposited my data. This is where I put, uh, this is my, IPy my IPython notebook right here. Here's the link, and so on. Um, maybe by applying pressure not just at the developmental end of things, but applying pressure through the journals, we could also make some progress. Um, these are ultimate goals, potentially. Um, so the, the editor that I'm uh, proposing is really not aimed at people, but most of this audience, in fact, is probably uh, far more technically uh, savvy than would, would needed to, uh, are needed for this, this kind of editor. This is a very simple editor. If you know how to use Emacs, then you're far and away, uh, you know, you're well beyond what kind of edit, what the, the types of things that this can do. Um, but the, the reason, there was a couple of reasons for, for doing this editor because uh, there, weren't, there was not a cross-platform editor that could do multiple languages that uh, if I was teaching some students uh, different statistics or just simple programming. Everybody had different editors. We had a major issue with this. Um, I wanted to go back and forth between R and Python within the same class. It was hard to do. Uh, so those were the motivations for, for actually developing this. Um, so this is written in Python, the entire editor. Uh, it was based on uh, QCintilla, written in uh, PyQt4. And <clears throat> it works with both R and Python languages. We heard a talk er earlier today that says uh, we want to limit the number of features. I could have tried to include arbitrary languages, anything that your, uh, the shell could sort of interpret. Um, but I figured just to start with R and Python would be a, a good way to keep the, the bugs down and to keep me focused because I was the only one working on this. Um, I am open to the community in terms of uh, different directions that we can go with this. Um, but for now, we're, we're keeping it as simple as possible. 
So uh, literate programming, many of you already know what it is, but it, just to sum it up, it's really the idea of mixing prose and code and having a report in the end, uh, which, is, which is great because we can now take people who are non-specialists, people who, do not, uh, who are not part of our domain, and now that we can put enough prose around our code, they can actually understand what we're doing without necessarily understanding lines of code. And that's, uh, that's really what this is about, is trying to be able to also uh, not just give someone, uh, <coughs> give someone a bunch of code that they can run with just a, a run.py, but uh, also that they can understand what's going on in the step-by-step -step basis. Um, these formats should be attractive. Uh, we, we live in a, a modern age with all kinds of nice uh, technologies that we can use. Uh, we should be able to produce PDF, HTML presentations, and, and just about anything that we would need uh, that, that people would necessarily want to consume in an output form. Um, these, these things need to be free and available to everyone for it to be reproducible. Uh, if, uh, if I'm a reviewer on a paper and someone has provided me with supplemental information, and they, it, all I have to do is run it through this program. It should be free. It should be easy to use. Um, and documentation, we've, we've alluded to it a few times earlier today, that documentation is hugely important. Uh, so this is sort of, uh, this summarizes how LP Edit works. <coughs> you choose an, uh, an input language, either R or Python. There are some trick ways to sort of uh, mix the two together within a, within a given report, but we'll just, we'll, we'll keep it uh, simple. Um, and from there, you can, you can use um, REST markup, which, which everyone is actually very familiar with. Um, you can also use a NoWeb, or you can use, this is an RNW, uh, which is the Sweeve uh, engine. And you can use Sweeve directly from R in the same way that you would do. Uh, and you can produce LaTeX, you can produce a LaTeX project or a Sphinx pod project. And from these projects, you can produce PDF output or HTML output. Uh, so this presentation was actually written using LP Edit, uh, and if there are spelling mistakes, it's because I haven't implemented my spelling uh, spell checker yet. Uh, but uh, so this is basically just a very quick line, just to show that it that, that it's working, and it works in very simple things. We can import uh, LP Edit. We can say hello Python and so on. Um, and we this is this is what we need to do inside of a, a Beamer document in order to make it work. You have to use the the fragile syntax. Uh, so let's. This is unfortunately not ideal. Okay. Just wanted to show the documentation, which is really large. And you can get this by uh, just uh, Googling LP Edit, and I'll, I can show the link later if we need to. But it's, everything is hosted on Bitbook, every, uh, Bitbucket. Everything is uh, open source. Um, all I really wanted to do was there's a number of different things in here that talk about reproducible research. It's sort of a generalized resource. Uh, but one of the nice things is this gallery of examples. Um, and some of the different examples, uh, they start off uh, very simple. Um, They start off very simple. This is just a, a very simple LaTeX document. All we're doing is the same thing as the, as the Sweeve syntax. We use the brackets to uh, enclose, enclose what the code chunk uh, is, and then we have the code, and we use an ampersand here to, to delimit the end. And that's it. Everything else we do, we keep exactly the same. Uh, we, we write LaTeX documents as we would normally. We just embed arbitrary code using these these two lines here. So the idea was to keep people focused on writing the actual reports and coding rather than uh, doing anything else. And so very little would actually need to be known about uh, the software itself. The only other thing, there is a command called include, which allows you to uh, carry different files along um, with your project. Uh, so this is a, a little bit more complicated example, um, Bayesian linear regression. Um, you, can, you see you can, this is so, it's using Sphinx. Everything looks really nice. Um, you can sort of embed images. Uh, there's tables. And this is actually one of the examples from the documentation. So you're welcome to download it and run it. You will have to install JAGS in order to make it work. Um, and so this is the MCMC. 
And it, it's showing all of the code, all of the output, but not necessarily all of the code. And sometimes what we want to do is maybe not show every function, so we can hide some functions by putting them inside a module and, and then pulling out only the stuff that really uh, allow, allows us to focus on what we're, what we're looking at. <clears throat> and so uh, I also have a, this is the supplement that I'm not going to have a lot of time to talk about, um, but I did, uh, I, I showed uh, that this uh, software works with a very large and more complicated pipeline uh, doing RNA-seq. And in order to do, so this was RNA-seq on a uh, organism that doesn't have annotations, so I had to create a database using, and I use SQL Alchemy to, to interface with that database, and there's some, uh, there are some ways to extract the table, uh, to show the table structure, the schema structure. Um, and so this is just another example, which is available for everyone to look at, of a far more complicated example of how to use uh, LP Edit. And I'm not even gonna try to demo because this, this resolution will make my software look absolutely crazy. <laughs> Um, but I do have the software up, uh, and so basically that's, this, this is the organism that the RNA-seq was done on, the cabbage butterfly. Um, I talked about the examples from the documentation. There's a number of things that still need to be done. There are some bugs uh, still. Uh, for example, it doesn't work on the most recent version of Ubuntu 13.04, but I don't know if people have started to play with that, there are actually a number of bugs with that version of Ubuntu. Um, I'd like to, I have to decide whether or not to include arbitrary scripting, like uh, allow in the preferences someone to set whatever program they would like to use and then be able to do that. Um, we have to obviously include more examples, customizations. There are some cold fo uh, code folding and inline spell checking that I'd like to do. But other than that, I'm, I'm really, my, I'm all open to the community as far as um, what, what things we can do to improve this software. It's really just a very simple editor that focuses on using LaTeX, using REST, um, and embedding code within. And these are the people that have been contributing uh, from the user side of it mostly, and I've been the, the lead developer on this. So with that, I'll take any questions. Yeah. <clears throat> How do you plan to develop code folding? I mean, I work for Spider, I would like to, I mean, maybe we could share code and develop like a JSON library. And yeah. Share okay. Code um, well, that is, it's actually all in. Yep, so he's asking how do I plan to implement code folding? Um, and this is, uh, it's already been implemented for the most part and I, I can, so the, in the, the Scintilla project or the Q Scintilla project, when they ported it over to PyQt, there was someone who implemented it and it, it works okay. Um, but in terms of my editor, it doesn't work well yet. There's gonna be a little bit of work to do. Um, so I don't have to implement that from scratch. Uh, but I did implement the highlighting from scratch, and that, that can be challenging. <laughs> I noticed that you had um, a track from R to LaTeX into HTML. I've already been under the impression that going from LaTeX to HTML is a serious change. Uh, you, have to, you have to specify. You, uh, he's asking if um, going from LaTeX to HTML is, it, it can be problematic, uh, and it, it's true, it can be problematic, and actually in, in the preferences section of the editor, you specify which program you want to use, whether it's LaTeX to HTML or TT, TTH, or I think that's the other one, or TTY, TTH, I think. Um, so you specify the program, and if it's there, uh, if the program exists on your computer, then it'll, it'll run, if it doesn't, it'll pop up with a warning. Um, and, we, and we talked a little bit about dependencies earlier today in one of these talks, and one of the things that I tried to do is when, when a dependency, for example, R, is not available, um, there's a button with information with all of the different operating systems, which websites you go to install, because um, it's, for people who are really just getting started, is actually a challenge getting all the, the prerequisites in order. Um, Yeah. 
Yes. I, I can. Um, uh, so he's asking if we could use something like the NITAR sort of, uh, syntax or expand the current uh, NoWeb syntax. Uh, so one of the major goals of this project was to keep it as simple as possible. Um, so maybe when we're in a classroom and I, and I need to teach, I, I really don't want to teach syntax. I'd, I'd rather teach LaTeX, R, Python, um, and spend the absolute minimal amount of time on the editor itself. And so that's, that's where the, the idea of just using the very basic syntax comes from. But I'm, I'm open to the idea of putting, putting extra things in there if, if the community would desire that. Um.